Hi there, my name is Dr Liz Gloyne. I'm a senior lecturer in Classics, based at the Classics Department at Royal Holloway, University of London. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Roman philosopher Seneca and some of his ideas about love and relationships. But before I get there, I'm going to give you a very brief overview about who Seneca was and a bit of background about Stoicism, which is the philosophical system that he ascribed to. So first of all, we have to really understand what ancient philosophy actually is. It's not a single thing, it's not a united one face object. There are lots and lots of different schools of how philosophy is understood. You have the Pre-Socratics, you have the Socrates, you have Aristotle and the academics, Zeno and the Stoics, who we're going to be talking about a bit more in a minute, Epicurus and the Epicureans, the Cynics, you have the Neoplatonists, I could go on. All of these were different ways of understanding the world and our place in it. So ancient philosophy was really understood as something that was meant to be systematic. It's meant to explain everything, not just little bits of the world here and there. It's got to be the whole picture. So Stoicism is an interrelated system that encompasses physics, ethics and logic. It's a lovely image that's sort of used about sort of the, the egg of philosophy with sort of the yolk, uh, the white and the shell all being those three different parts. The Roman Stoics, in the writings we have from them, um, we tend to think of them as being focused on ethics, but you can't just pick and choose. All of those three things intertwine with each other, so you can't have Stoic ethics without also having Stoic physics and logic. All that thinking is interrelated, even if we don't necessarily think about it in those terms. So Stoicism originates in Hellenistic Greece. It's founded in Athens by Zeno of Citium, and it's named after the Stoa, or the portico where the school met, rather than the founder. And that's really quite important, because I mentioned a, a minute ago um, Epicurus and the Epicureans, named after the founder, Epicurus. Um, so this really reflects a different attitude. The Epicureans are very much about following the rules that Epicurus set down. The Stoics are much more about working it out from yourself. Here are the core principles, and this is about working it out, applying it to your own circumstances. Um, all these sort of Hellenistic philosophies come to Rome um, and they become quite popular amongst the upper classes. It's not really a surprise that this becomes an elite sport, as it were, because in order to philosophise, you have to have time. And time is something you have when you have enslaved people to do your labour for you and a lot of material resource to rely on. So philosophy as a rich person's game, a rich man's game, yes, but a rich person's game is sort of quite important to be aware of. So here we come to Seneca, who is born in around 4 BC. Uh, he dies in 65 AD. Uh, he's a Roman writer and politician. Uh, he rises to great prominence as the tutor and later the advisor of the Emperor Nero. He was brought back from exile, actually, by Nero's mother, Agrippina, um, in order to become Nero's tutor. And it's a really sort of interesting, difficult relationship because Nero is the first person to come to the imperial throne as a boy, as a kid, really. Um, so he sort of, so he gets brought along as sort of the tutor, the educator, and then they have to work out and evolve what this system looks like as he sort of moves into sort of more of an advisor role, a speech writer, sort of a, special, a political special advisor, if we were going to look for sort of a modern political equivalent. Um, but of course, that's all. Uh, tied up with the fact that he's been teaching Nero since he was a teenager, right? Um, it all gets sort of very, it's all being made up as, as we go along, uh, it all gets a bit complicated, a bit personal, um, and of course the relationship doesn't end well because eventually Nero uh, forces Seneca to commit political suicide after he has been implicated in an assassination plot. We ought to be very clear here when we talk about political suicide, we're, we're not talking about it as we might conceptualise it today, it's very much about a way of uh, the the elite classes being given some kind of control over their own their own state executions essentially you know the, the choice is essentially given you have the option either of taking your own life in comfortable surroundings under your own steam as it were um, or alternatively um, somebody from the Praetorian Guard will be along tomorrow morning with a large sword so, you know, it, it sort of is a, it's a facade of control for sort of these elite Romans. But this is what Nero forces Seneca and many others to do, actually. Um, but before 
that happens. Um, Seneca has uh, this very active political life. He's also, alongside all of that, a prolific writer in a range of different genres. He works in tragedy, he works in comic poetry, and for our purposes today, most interestingly, he works in philosophy. So he actually gives us the biggest and most comprehensive corpus of writing about Stoicism from the Roman period. So obviously, good question, what is Stoicism? Uh, so all ancient philosophies really are, are interested in what will make us happy. And the answers that the Stoics give to that is that what will make us happy is full exercise of our reason. And they say that that is the same as behaving virtuously. It also happens to be the same as acting in accordance with nature. It's a really important keyword, katafusin is the Greek, uh, to act in accordance with nature. And they also argue that the world is ordered in the best possible way by a providential underlying reason. So this is the best of all possible worlds. It doesn't mean everything's perfect, I hasten to add, but just that, all things being equal, we're in the world that's turning out the best possible way it could. I appreciate that might be a slight stretch for the imagination at present, but this would be what the Stoics would argue. And the third very big idea to be aware of uh, is the idea of fate. Everything is fated. Because this is the best of all possible worlds, it's fated that things will fall out in certain ways. But we still have a moral responsibility. We don't get taken off the hook because everything was preordained. This is sort of the, uh, um, the image they use often is a dog tied behind a cart. So, for instance, uh, two, two dogs tied behind the cart. One dog can see where the cart is going and trots on happily behind. The other ignores the cart and runs off that way and runs off that way and tries to do loop around and all sorts of other exciting things and ends up still being dragged behind the cart even though it doesn't want to follow. Um, so the, the Stoic would say that what you you want to do is you want to become the, the dog who can see where the cart is going and follow along behind without suffering um, and still having to go in the same direction. So Stoicism is in a way profoundly countercultural. The priority has become on becoming virtuous and pursuing virtuous action rather than getting political power or working in service to the state. It's not that obviously a good Stoic won't do those things if that is the virtuous thing to do, but that's not the priority. Uh, so Seneca often contrasts the goals that he has for his readers to those of good Roman civic ideology, where the really important thing is to be a good citizen, whereas for the Stoics it's like the important thing is to be virtuous which may be achieved by meeting somebody else's definition of a good citizen. Um, but that contrast between that, those two sets of goals often shows the problems with traditional Roman moral ideology. So where does the family fit into the Stoic model? Well, friends and family are indifference. Uh, that is, they are not virtue. Uh, the only thing worth chasing in life is virtue. Uh, nothing else is. So, for instance, um, health is an indifferent. Uh, wealth, money is an indifferent. Life itself is an indifferent. The only thing that's worth pursuing is virtue. So all of these indifference shouldn't be confused with virtue or pursued as a goal within themselves. They're not good and bad in and of themselves either, but it depends how they're deployed and how they're used. Um, now, obviously, something like the family is a bit more complicated, or friendship is a bit more complicated than money. Money, obviously, is an inanimate object. Um, but a person who you might be entering into a relationship with, whether a romantic or a friendly one, um, is, is, is a person. They have their own uh, moral stance, they have their own personality, their own traits. And that kind of needs to be factored into how we approach these things. So Seneca, for instance, uh, suggests that we need to surround ourselves with other people who are also striving towards virtue, who share our journey. And this includes um, people who we are married to, our spouses. Now, that said, family and marriage are also catafusin, secundum naturam, according to nature. So since the Stoics think this is the best of all possible worlds, organised by a providential deity, what that, that means is, what they say you can do is you can look to the natural world for signs of what is natural and thus according with reason. And one of the things that they take from that look to the natural world is that families and reproduction and bonding between couples is one of those natural things. 
Uh, in particular, there's there's a lovely example where he refers to the way that um, uh, a mother a mother animal will protect her child, and they use this as an example of the naturalness of of parents seeking to protect children and of caring for things that are not in their own interest. We'll come back to that in a minute. Stoicism also actually says that women have an equal potential for virtue as men because it is being human um, that gives you that potential, that has that potential for virtue because we all have, re um, all have reason, have a shared reason as humans. And this isn't something Seneca explores at great length or doesn't think about it, but there's a whole bunch of repercussions in there for how you think about the marital relationship. Um, in this, of course, he is a bit different to Plato, for instance, and also to the early Stoics and to Aristotle, um, who don't really think about women as being potential equal partners in the way that marriage works. Um, this is all very different, of course, to Roman understanding of marriage, which sees um, marriage primarily as a property transfer mechanism. Uh, the idea is you create heirs and that moves stuffs along and keeps it in the family. Um, Roman society does have the idea of companionate marriage, the idea of working together towards the same goal, sharing affection with each other. Um, for the Stoics, however, there's this added concept of working towards virtue together, at least as things are ideally constructed, uh, as part of a broader community that individuals exist in. So the family very much sits at the centre of that process, the idea of, of relating to other people through the process of oikiosis. Oikiosis is a process of assimilating other people's interests to your own. It's illustrated by the Stoic Hierocles by using a series of concentric circles. So sort of circles overlapping outside each other. And right in the middle, <clears throat> in that very central circle, is the self. Uh, and then in the next circle out, you have parents, siblings, spouse and children. So first degree relationships. Um, beyond that, you have aunts, uncles, nephews, that kind of thing, grandparents, and then further members of your family, and so on and so on and so on. And the idea is <clears throat> that you bring other people into that central circle where yourself is, circle by circle by circle, until finally the sage encompasses all of humanity inside what they think of as being in their interests. Uh, so those first circle out relationships, those first degree relationships, the parents, the siblings, the spouse and the children, become central to understanding human relationships because uh, all other relationships are based on them and that becomes our model for expanding our model of care out to the rest of humanity. Uh, the idea of taking those initial relationships um, in which the, the parent, for instance, expands their interest out to their child, um, the sibling to other siblings, and so on and so forth. Now this is a really different idea to how Roman society usually conceptualises itself. Uh, think about the way that the, the Roman family is, is thought about. You have the pater familias right at the top and everyone else very firmly under the hierarchy. Uh, indeed, Roman society uh, during Seneca's period also is very hierarchically organised under the emperor. So something that's sort of much flatter and much more equal um, and is about bringing people in towards you rather than sort of consolidating power is really very different. It's also a very different idea about relationships than, for instance, what we might find in Ovid's Ars Amatoria. Um, in that particular poem, Ovid sets up love as a game, a contest. It's about sort of the chase, really. He's not really interested in what happens next. You know, what do you do once you've got her? I mean, that, as far as Ovid's concerned, you're done, right? Seneca, however, is thinking about love and relationships in terms of aiming for a settled, balanced existence. Um, so Ovid's all about the play, keeping things exciting. Seneca is almost the exact opposite. He wants to build lasting, not fleeting relationships, and is interested in how those relationships mature and grow, rather than sort of the, those very preliminary early stages of a relationship. Uh, I do just want to have a quick note on queer relationships. Uh, Seneca is really not very bothered by them. Um, when they are mentioned, which they are, uh, they tend to be in the ter terms of um, wider, wider conversations about luxuria, luxuria, luxury, self-indulgent habits, excess, that kind of thing. Um, you sort of get a comment, a negative comment about um, homosexuality immediately sort of followed by why it's awful to grow hothouse flowers. One of these things is not like the other. Um, so 
you have got a writer writing in a society that uses certain homophobic stereotypes and linguistic idioms, which of course he uses, just as he uses the same embedded sexist language in his writings. But on the other hand, this is the society that in not too long will give us um, the Emperor Hadrian and his lover Antinous, um, who gets temples set up to him in Egypt. So, you know, we, we, we're in a culture that has sort of quite a quite a conflicted view about um, homosexual relationships, but Seneca is not sort of jumping on a, a bandwagon here. We don't see the vitriol we see in Juvenal, the satirist, uh, partly because obviously satire is always about vitriol, um, and Seneca is not really thinking in those terms. So while it would be quite easy to sort of um, argue for a sort of very negative reading um, of Seneca's attitude to homosexuality, really there's not very much in there at all. Um, and it is to say, when it is there about critique, it's much more about um, how those behaviours feed into wider habits of self-indulgence rather than necessarily the sexual behaviour itself. So what happens to these ideas as we go forward? Well, that influence is quite subtle. This isn't core Stoic doctrine. Um, what the family does isn't sort of something that people pay a great deal of attention to it. But what I would really like to emphasise is that that equal capacity for virtue, the fact that women and men have an equal capacity, even if they're not necessarily given the same opportunities, uh, becomes very important, particularly in the Renaissance, as you start to get women who wish to take part in classical learning and wish to put themselves in a position where they're arguing for their own moral capacity and indeed their own intellectual capacity. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I hope that's helpful for giving you a bit of a framework <coughs> about where Seneca sits in broader conversations about uh, love and relationships and how to understand him in a broader stoic context. If you've got any questions, uh, you can reach me at liz.gloin at uh, rollholloway.act.uk. I'm also on Twitter as Liz Gloin, and I'd love to hear from you and uh, find out how you're getting on with the material you're dealing with at A-level. And uh, yeah, have a great day.